So welcome everyone to the 11th installment of Philosophers Meet Critics, a YouTube channel sponsored by Concept at the University of Cologne and the Federal University of Bahia. In this series, we discuss recently published books that deal with issues that are epistemological. And we have the authors address questions from other philosophers. Please stay tuned for the next videos. In this installment of the series, we discuss Professor Stephanie Collins' book, Group Duties, Their Existence and the implica Implications for Individuals, which was recently published by Oxford University Press. Stephanie Collins is a professor at the Dianoia Institute of Philosophy at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne, Australia. She's currently working on a major three-year project called Organizations Wrongdoings from Metaphysics to Practice, which is being funded by the Australian Research Council, Discovery Early Career Research Award. Professor Collins' work deals with the philosophy of human groups. She's interested in how we should conceptualize their uh, conceptualize their ontological commitments, their mental and epistemic capacities, agency, responsibility, and duties. The critics of Professor Collins' books are Professor Frank Hendricks, at, uh, a professor of ethics, social, and political philosophy at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and uh, um, Leonie Smith, lecturer in philosophy at Cardiff University. So Professor Collins, why don't you start with telling us about the main ideas you've put forward in your book, Group Duties. Thanks so much, Sven, and thanks so much to Frank and Leonie for agreeing to um, provide their own work on topics related to the book today. Greatly, greatly appreciate it and hope it's enjoyable for people to watch watch it and hope it's enjoyable for people to watch. Okay, uh, you should now be able to see my uh, PowerPoint. Um, so I'm discussing my book, Group Duties, Their Existence and Their Implications for Individuals. And in this book, I am concerned to try to unpack and analyze claims that we make in our day-to-day -day lives about the duties of groups. So here are three examples that I start with in the book. Um, as a nation, we may have different views on immigration, but surely we can all agree that Britain has a moral duty to provide safe harbour to more people fleeing conflicts. This was a statement made in an editorial in The Observer in 2019 looks on the face of it like the attribution of a moral duty to a group, namely Britain. Here's another example, I think quite different example. Conservatives have a particular moral duty, sorry, particular duty to defend liberal democratic civilization from Trump's authoritarianism. This is a statement made by a commenter on the blog uh, brightblue.org.uk, a kind of um, conservative um, blog. Um, this author is referring, I think, to conservatives across at least the Atlantic, across or at least uh, the UK and the United States. So we shouldn't take conservatives here to be the conservative party of the UK, the conservative political party. Um, this author is rather talking about conservatives as a kind of social movement or a group of people who are committed to certain values, something like this, leaving that kind of loose for now. They're talking about conservatives um, and as a kind of uh, political ideology kind of sense. Okay. Uh, and they're attributing a duty to that group. Final example, um, the international community has a moral responsibility, a political duty and a humanitarian obligation. I won't distinguish what those three things might be and how those three things might be different. Let's assume that all of those are some form of moral duty uh, to stop the bloodbath and find peace for the people of Syria. This was Ban Ki-moon, UN, uh, UN uh, Secretary General, speaking in 2012. So here, um, a moral duty is being attributed to the international community, which I take it from the context, particularly in the mouth of 
the Secretary General of the United Nations, um, international community refers to the community of all states or all member states of the United Nations. Um, this is not a group that's um, unified under any kind of particular ideology or viewpoint or shared goals, as we might think conservatives are. So it's an even more disunified group than the group conservatives. Okay. So these are the kinds of everyday statements that I want to try and um, understand analyze and ultimately um, figure out which of these statements are defensible and which aren't. Um, which are def And by defensible here, what I mean is conceptually defensible. Do these statements attribute duties to a group that has the capacity to bear duties or not? Okay, so here, um, uh, here are the kind of important things to note about statements like these. First of all, um, no member of the group can do the thing. Um, that the obligation is being attributed about, right? Um, no individual member of the UK, not um, even the Prime Minister, um, acting alone, right, um, can ensure like safe harbour for a large number of refugees. Um, no individual Conservative can stop anyone's authoritarianism. Uh, no individual member of the international community, uh, except for maybe Syria itself, but no other member of the international community can find peace for the people of Syria. So um, assuming that autumn implies can, assuming that obligation implies ability, slightly more specific version of what implies can, but assuming that's true, something like that is true. Um, it can't be that any one member of the group has these obligations. It has to be that the group itself has the obligation if there is an obligation to do these things. These things like um, providing safe harbor for refugees, stopping Trump's authoritarianism, um, finding peace for the people of Syria. It's got to be attributed to the group, not to the member assuming that autumn plays can. And that's an assumption that I make in the book. I assume that autumn plays can. Okay. Um, also notice that in these statements, the group is treated as a unitary entity. It's treated as one thing. And we attribute an obligation to that one thing. Some people working on this think that we're not really treating it as one thing. We're treating it as a plurality of things. Um, either way, we're predicating something, a moral duty um, of the group itself. We're treating it as kind of an object. Um, um, in our, as we talk about them. Okay, so the, I have two questions about these kinds of statements. There are two questions that I try to answer in the book regarding these kinds of attributions of moral duties to groups. The first is, is the group in question the kind of entity that can bear a moral duty? That's what I was getting at before with asking the question of whether these kinds of statements are conceptually defensible. So is Britain the kind of entity that can bear a moral duty? Are conservatives, understood as a broad social movement rather than a political party, uh, the kind of entity that can bear a moral duty? Is the international community the kind of entity that can bear a moral duty? And so this first question I'm interested in asking. Second question I'm interested in asking is, what does the attribution of duties to these groups imply about the duties of the group's members? Um, and we'll see that it implies different things depending on whether the group in question is the kind of entity that can bear a duty itself or not. Okay, I'll get on to that. So those are the questions that um, I try to answer in the book. And to answer them, I divide groups into three broad categories. Uh, so the first category of groups that I talk about is uh, the category that Britain falls into. So this category is collectives. Collectives, as I kind of define them, are constituted by agents who are united under a rationally operated group level decision making procedure that has the potential to attend to moral considerations. That, that is the procedure has the potential to attend to moral considerations. Uh, examples of collectives include Britain, ExxonMobil, Oxfam, right? so states, for-profit entities and you know, charities or non-profit organizations are all gonna count as collectives in this sense. The second kind of group that I uh, theorize in the book, um, you might have guessed this, is the kind of group that, uh, that the social movement conservatives um, falls into. So this kind of group is coalitions. Um, coalitions are constituted by agents who each hold a particular goal. Sorry for the typo on the slides, that should be goal or can be plural, but at least they hold one goal in common. Um, and the agents are disposed to work with the others to realize the goal. Um, I won't go into the details of the, how that disposition becomes manifested and stuff. Um, those are kind of details that are in the book. Um, but examples of coalitions are things like conservatives, right? Um, the group that Beyond Blue, uh, sorry, not Beyond Blue, 
bright blue was attributing to um, attributing a duty to. Um, another example of a coalition arguably is the alt-right. Another example of a coalition arguably is the oil lobby. This would be um, an example of a coalition whose members are collectives. So collectives themselves can be members of coalitions alongside other individuals or collectives. Um, there are going to be debates about which real world political groups count as coalitions, um, just as there will be debates about which ones count as collectives. I'm taking these examples to be relatively clear examples. I'm happy that there are kind of grey cases and vague cases of each of these three categories. I think most interesting concepts are kind of vague, um, but these are some examples to kind of point at what I'm getting at with this concept of a coalition. And then the third kind of group is a combination, which is kind of everything else, everything that's not a collective or a coalition, any uh, collection of agents that is not uh, a collective or a coalition. So um, a combination then uh, is constituted by any collection of agents where those agents do not together constitute either a collective or a coalition. Um, the international community if that is understood as something different from the United Nations um, General Assembly or members of the United Nations, if we take the international community as kind of separate from the United Nations, um, then the international community is going to count as a combination. Um, I think lots of socially important groups um, like men and white people and rich people are going to count as combinations. They are not um, groups whose members share any goals in common or at least not any goals that make them um, interestingly distinct from other groups. You might think maybe all men have the implicit goal of upholding patriarchy, arguably so do many women, <laughs> it's not going to pick out men, right? So um, I think lots of lots of social interesting groups, unfortunately, are going to end up being combinations. Uh, and I have a view of unrestricted composition about combinations. So me and Shakespeare are a combination. That's fine. Fine with that. It can be very permissive about um, which kinds of groups can be combinations. Okay, so because I said that uh, collectives can be members of coalitions, it should um, hopefully already be clear to you that I take collectives to be agents. Uh, I'm not going to get into the arguments for that here, um, that's in the book. But uh, my view is that uh, collectives are agents, neither coalitions nor combinations are agents. So these are the three kinds of collective that I analyze in the book. And I think these three kinds of collective are exhaust, sorry, three kinds of group, it's late in the day here. These three kinds of group are exhaustive of the um, kinds of groups that there are in the world. Of course, there are many ways of dividing up um, the collections of groups that we see in the world. There are many ways of kind of cutting nature at its joints where it, when it comes to groups. Um, I think when we're talking about duties and we're wanting to attribute duties to groups, these are the joints that we find in nature. So I think these three categories are exhaustive of all types of groups that we find, but I'm not claiming that this particular way of dividing up groups into three different categories is the most interesting or only way to divide up groups like for all possible purposes. That's not the claim. Okay, moving on. So um, I have a kind of, I, I, I like a little flow chart, uh, a little a little decision map um, for how to work out whether uh, a particular duty attribution to a group is conceptually defensible. Um, so first of all, ask yourself, um, is the group to which a duty is being attributed a collective? Supposing it is a collective, right? Go to the left-hand side of this diagram. If it is a collective, I argue the group can bear duties in its own right. And when the group bears a duty, each of its members bears a membership duty. These words that are in red on the slide, I'm going to define on the next slide. If the group that is being attributed a duty is not a collective, so if it's, for example, conservatives or the international community, um, then that group, I argue, cannot bear duties in its own right. Um, instead of asserting group duties, we should insert that each of its members bears a coordination duty. Again, I'm going to say what that is on the next slide. Um, and then if the group is not a collective, there's a further question that we should ask, which is, is the group in question a coalition or a combination? If it's a coalition, like conservatives, then when each of the members has a coordination duty, that duty, that coordination duty is a duty to engage in something that I call coalition reasoning. I'm going to define that on the next slide. Um, if the group in question is a combination, then when each of the members has a coordination duty, that duty is a duty to I reason, 
which is something I define on the next slide. So this is the kind of um, the model, if you like. This is the this is the process that we should go through when working out whether um, whether a particular attribution of duties to a group um, sticks to the group itself, and then also what that implies for the members, um, because you can see the terms highlighted in red there um, are all about the duties of the members. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the duties of the members. This is the last sort of substantive uh, slide. Uh, okay, it's kind of wordy, but I just wanted to kind of get the definitions down there. So um, a membership duty is a duty that's held by an agent um, in virtue of that agent's being a member of a collective. Remember, a collective is an organized group with a decision-making procedure like Britain or Oxfam or ExxonMobil. Um, so membership duty is held by an agent in virtue of the agents being a member of a collective that has a duty. And what a membership duty demands, like say the UK has a duty to admit more refugees, um, what does that imply for like, the prime minister or an individual citizen? Um, it requires that that agent, that member, use their role in the collective, if possible and as appropriate, uh, with a view to seeing to it that the collective does its duty. So if Britain has a duty to provide safe harbour for more refugees, this means that the prime minister um, has a duty to uh, use his role um, in the collective, if possible and as appropriate, with a view to seeing it that Britain does that, um, and so do um, voters as well. In my view, um, voters are members of um, the collectives that are states. That's kind of actually a controversial view, but allow me that for now. Okay, so that's how that works. That's how membership duties work. So when a collective has a duty, then that, um, that implies stuff for the members. The, the duty doesn't just sit at the level of the collective, kind of inertly. Um, it, it feeds down to the members as well. Okay, so for um, coalitions and combinations, things work slightly differently. So uh, coalitions and combinations are not groups that can bear duties in their own right. Um, so what does this mean? Does this mean there's no duty to find uh, peace for the people of Syria? No, 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 no. What it means is uh, we have to um, kind of cut out our talk of um, duties that belong to like conservatives or the international community and replace that talk with talk of coordination duties that are attributed to each um, individual member of conservatives or the international community. Okay, and these duties of the members are coordination duties. Coordination duties come in two flavors, if you like. Um, the first flavor um, is our duties to collectivize. Um, so these are duties held by an agent, like an individual conservative or an individual member of the international community, which remember that individual member of the international community can itself be a collective because they are agents. Um, okay, coll collectivization is duty is a duty held by an agent that requires the agent to act responsibly to others with a view to their existing a collective that will bear a duty to solve a morally pressing problem. Collectivization duties are duties to do what you can to create collectives, to create agents that can then uh, bear duties in their own right. Okay. The other kind of coordination duty is a responsiveness duty. These are duties, again, held by an agent, like an individual conservative or an individual member of the international community, um, where these duties require that agent to act responsibly with others with a view to directly solving whatever the morally pressing problem is, right? Um, finding peace for the people of Syria, stopping Trump's authoritarianism, what have you. Um, okay, you might think, why care about the difference between these? Uh, Collectivization duties kind of pass the buck onto the collective that gets created, right? Once you've created the collective that has the duty, it's then up to that collective um, that you've created to make sure that stuff gets done. Um, and it's on them, it's on that collective if it doesn't happen. Whereas responsiveness duties are duties on the members um, of the group that was initially attributed a duty, where those members are required to kind of see through the action to the end, see through the action until the morally pressing problem is solved. Okay, great. So that's coordination duties. Um, I mentioned on the previous slide that um, when you're a member of a coalition, your coordination duty requires you to do coalition reasoning. Um, coalition reasoning, um, if you have a duty to coalition reason, then you have a duty to uh, do the best that you can towards the outcome over which there is a purported group duty, like um, finding peace for the people of Syria, stopping Trump's authoritarianism. Um, and you must do that on the assumption that the others in your coalition will do their bit towards the goal that unites the coalition, right? So conservatives, for example, 
if you're an individual conservative and you've got um, a coordination duty orientated around the outcome of stopping Trump's authoritarianism, slightly outdated example, I realize now, sorry, but you know, books are off their time. It's either, it's either, a, it's either it's super abstract or it loses its relevance. I feel like those are your options. Anyway, um, you have a um, duty to do what you individually can um, to act responsibly to other conservatives to try and stop Trump's authoritarianism. Um, then what you're required to do as an individual conservative is do the best that you can in response to others on the assumption that the other conservatives will pursue the goals of, you know, market freedom, um, individual liberty, um, maybe some um, kind of uh, social traditionalism, whatever we take to be the goals that unite conservatives. Um, do what you can towards stopping Trump's authoritarianism on the assumption that the other members of your coalition are going to um, do act towards the goals that uh, the coalition is united around. Okay, so in other words, if you're a member of a coalition, like you've got a little more certainty about what the others in your group are going to do, and that affects what you as an individual should do. Uh, it means that you can plan and plot um, your uh, actions of responsiveness uh, in a slightly more um, delimited way. Whereas if you are a member of a mere combination, which is the kind of, remember, catch all grab bag of any group that's not um, united by a decision making procedure or united by shared goals. If you're a member of a combination, then, um, and we, and we want to say that your group has a duty, what does that ultimately imply for you? Well, all it implies is that you've got a duty to do the best that you can towards the outcome over which there's the purported group duty, given kind of whatever evidence um, you, um, whatever you have reason to believe others in the combination will do. Uh, so if you're a member of the international community, right, which uh, is a mere combination, it's not a coalition, and the international community, if we, we try to attribute to the international community an obligation to uh, find peace for the people of Syria, uh, that duty is not going to stick to the international community because it um, doesn't have, I argue, you can see the book for why, I argue it doesn't have the right kind of structure and agency to bear a moral duty. Um, so it's not going to stick to the group. Um, instead, it's going to stick to the individual members, um, individual states, and including um, individual human as well, members of the international community. Um, but all that those individual um, members of that group are going to have obligations to do is the best that they can given whatever they happen to believe others in the group will do. So you're a bit more at sea if you're a member of a combination than if you're a member of a coalition is the upshot there. Uh, and my hunch, I don't actually talk about this in the book, but um, my hunch is that that means collectivizing is often going to be more important in combinations than in coalitions because combinations are kind of so disunified that often it's going to have to be that um, we're going to have to really create some structure to this group before we can think about solving the morally pressing problem. I don't actually talk about that in the group in the book, but that's my hunch. Okay, so those are some key terms there. There's the flow chart again. I just put that there in case we have to come back to it. Um, and little shout out for those uh, watching this on YouTube. Um, here's the lovely cover of the book. If you use this promo code at oup.com slash academic, then you get 30% off. So there's the promo code for you there in the slides. Um, thank you. Um, thanks so much for watching. And I'll sit, pass it over to the commentators. Yeah, thank you very much for this um, summary of the book, Stephanie. Um, so we have um, two commentators, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Fran Hendricks from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and Leonie Smith from the University of Cardiff in the UK. So um, Frank, why don't you go ahead and give us your comments? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I find this book uh, very exciting. I've read it a number of times. Uh, and. Yeah, Stephanie's um, presentation is, is very clear, of course, and it reveals that her approach is very rich um, and it, it covers everything when I'm talking about collectives, uh, yeah, coalitions and combinations. Um, and it's, uh, it's also very uh, well developed in the book. Now, I'm going to zoom in on collectives. And as uh, Stephanie discussed, these are agents, and I'm going to call them collective agents because of that. Now, my question is, what does it 
take for an organization to be a collective moral agent. I'm going to argue that it requires them to have a moral point of view. And I'll explain what that means. But the key issue is that um, this is a controversial claim. And here on the screen, you see uh, two um, old classics on the topic, uh, Peter French, Collective and Corporate Responsibility, and uh, Liston Pettit, the book on group agency, and of course, the, the modern classic by uh, Stephanie Collins on group duties. And they all defend the idea that it is easier for collective agents to be moral agents than I believe it is. So that's the key issue. Now, let me see how I can. Yes, there is the next slide. So what I call the simple view has it that collective agents are necessarily moral agents. That means that any group of people who form an organization that constitutes a collective agent uh, thereby also form a moral agent. So you can always hold them responsible. And that's an attractive feature of this view. However, maybe it's too quick. I will argue that it's possible for a collective agent not to be a moral agent. And the underlying idea is what I just mentioned, uh, perhaps collective uh, moral agency requires uh, an agent to have a moral point of view, which might be a matter of um, having some conception of its own identity or uh, a matter of regarding itself as a moral uh, agent. And collective agents might not have such a moral view, point of view. So then we need to start thinking differently about uh, collective moral agency. But why, why should we be concerned with this? Uh, the, the underlying issues are very abstract. Well, I think it's directly important to, to practice uh, um, because, yeah, how should we attribute res responsibility? Uh, sorry, how should we interpret responsibility attributions to ExxonMobil, for instance? Well, if we cannot no longer assume that it's a moral agent, uh, we might have to check for that. And it might be that we are too quick in practice to, um, to respond to respons uh, attribute responsibility. Another more constructive uh, issue is how can collective moral agency be promoted? So if it is not to be taken for granted that uh, organizations or collective agents are moral agents, then we should figure out what else is required and we should perhaps try and implement that. So I will start by um, saying a little bit about the simple view, then discuss the moral point of view, and then I turn to Stephanie's point of view. So what I already said was that according to the simple view, collective agents are necessarily moral agents. And this is how I interpret uh, Peter Friends and David Kopp when they talk about uh, collective moral agency, they basically claim moral agency is the same as agency and agents are always rational in some sense. Uh, perhaps they have to be able to reflect on, on their choices, but that's all that is required. And collective agents are rational agents in this sense, and they can also reflect on the choices and uh, their actions and decisions. Um, so it implies that all collective agents will be moral agents. Now, List and Pettit develop a qualified version of this uh, view. They allow for some exceptions. By default, collective agents are moral agents. But there are a couple of things you have to keep in mind. The one is, it is conceivable that you have an organization and all of its members are, for instance, psychopaths. So they are not moral agents themselves. Well, as the, the members of a, of a collective agent have to keep the discussion going and, and contribute to these decisions, then that uh, collective agent will not be a moral agent. So it's an exception. The other possibility is that there are certain procedures in place that um, bar members from uh, introducing moral issues into the discussion. Or more formally, the pro procedures restrict the agenda to descriptive propositions. 
So you can only talk about facts and not about norms or values. In that case, the collective agent is not a moral agent either. So basically the idea is the simple view says, any collective agent is a moral, uh, moral agent. Uh, the qualified simple view allows for a couple of uh, exceptions, but these are rather far-fetched. So by default, we can assume that uh, collective agents are moral agents. Now, I've been mentioning this uh, idea that moral agency requires a moral point of view. Well, what does that mean? Well, to explain that, I consider the two dominant approaches to moral agency in contemporary philosophy. And the first is what is sometimes called the deep self approach. So a moral agent must have a deep self. Now, I find this uh, uh, more attractive to talk about a moral identity. So you need to have certain commitments. Uh, there's a version defended by Harry Frankfurt who argues, well, we should, uh, a moral agent has certain values, and that is a matter of having certain priorities about the desires on which this uh, agent acts. So you might want to act on your desires to do, uh, yeah, to volunteer for certain things, for charities, and you might want to not act on your, your craving for, for smoking or something. And the first establishes that charities are something that you regard as valuable. That's part of your identity. And the second is something you kind of set aside, even though you might engage in it. Now, the smoking ex uh, example is uh, relevant because Frankfurt's main examples are the willing addict and the unwilling addict. So the question is, is someone responsible for taking drugs? And he argues, well, if you take drugs because you cannot resist the urge to do so, then yeah, you're excused because this is something so powerful that you cannot fight it. And then we cannot hold you responsible. However, if you are a willing addict, if you kind of chose to start taking drugs and if you, you already expected that you would enjoy it and that you would want to live that kind of uh, life, perhaps you are a, a reasonably functioning addict, then it is part of your identity. You want to give priority to your urges in this respect. And then, of course, we will hold you uh, responsible. We might blame you for, for taking drugs and all the effects that it has. Now, Frankfurt argues that these examples should feed into our conception of moral agency. So we should assume that moral agency requires having a moral identity because otherwise we cannot make sense of the difference between these, these two uh, attributions of responsibility uh, to the willing addict on the one hand and the unwilling addict on the other. Now, the second approach um, is the reason responsiveness approach um, it was proposed by um, uh, Fischer and Ravisa. Um, and they are most known for the claim that a moral agent has to be responsive to moral reasons. And uh, yeah, basically everybody, uh, well, lots of people agree with that nowadays. But there is also a part of their view where they insist that a moral agent has a moral self-conception. Um, and their example is that of the malevolent hypnotist. So here the idea is that you are uh, hypnotized by someone and then you do certain things and you can basically carry out the evil intentions of the hypnotist. Now, it seems we will again excuse you because this is not you who is doing it, but the hypnotist in a sense. Um, and Fischer and Visa then argue, well, you have not taken responsibility for uh, the actions you perform under, under hypnosis. So conversely, we have to conceive of a moral agent as someone who, who, who does conceive of his ordinary ways of thinking and deliberating and making decisions and performing actions as something that he or she or they take um, uh, responsibility for. And they see themselves as a suitable target for praise and blame. So again, this has to be part of a conception of moral agency in order to be able to accommodate an example such as that of a malevolent hypnotist. Now, suppose this is correct. 
what does it imply for collective moral agency? Well, the thing to note is that a collective agent need not have a moral point of view. It might lack a moral identity. It never came around to forming higher order uh, desires, for instance, or adopting values. And it might also lack a moral self-conception. It might not see itself as a responsible agent. Now, let's turn to Stephanie Collins' view. And remember, the overall question is, what does it take to be a collective moral agent? I've just argued, well, you need to have a more, and the organization needs to have a moral point of view. But this runs counter the simple view. Now, it seems that uh, Stephanie supports the simple view. She claims that all collectives are moral agents, and all, all collectives can attend to moral considerations, which is the key feature, uh, perhaps the only feature of collective moral agency. And she makes a further comment, a group that cannot attend to moral considerations would not be a moral agent, but it would also not be a collective, not a collective agent. So I've been reading the book and wonder, wondering whether uh, Stephanie supports a qualified, qualified simple view or, or the, 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 the simple view. And she does mention the two qualifications I mentioned earlier. So she does require that a collective moral agent has moral members and that it has procedures that allow uh, it to consider um, uh, moral, uh, moral issues or that it at least is a not too remote possibility. However, if these features are lacking, then the group is not even a collective agent. So even though she makes these qualifications, there are um, not exceptions to the claim that all collective agents are moral agents because when one of these qualifications is actual, then the group is not even a collective agent. So this makes me uh, think that Collins supports a simple view. Now, she herself characterizes her view as, uh, as permissive. It doesn't take much uh, for a collective agent to be a moral agent. Um, I have defended a richer, uh, more demanding conception of collective moral agency, which requires a moral identity. And uh, Stephanie notes that I just set the bar too high. Now, actually, I've, she might be right about this, but I'm still going to uh, return the favor and uh, suggest that uh, both of our views might be wrong, actually, uh, because uh, Collins' accounts might be too permissive at the end of the day. So my questions to, uh, to Stephanie all surround around this issue is, is, is your account, Steph, uh, is it too permissive after all? And the question is motivated by these examples of the willing addict and the malevolent uh, hypnotist. And I just wonder whether you, first of all, believe that an account of collective moral agency should, should accommodate cases like this. And the second is, of course, um, how you might want to do that if you agree with that. So yeah, it's my pleasure to, uh, to comment on, uh, on Steph and I'm looking forward to her reply. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Frank, for these comments. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to respond right away? Yeah, I would love to. Thanks so much, Frank. I, I really greatly appreciate um, uh, appreciate these comments. Um, excellent. And I, I have I really enjoy your account of collective moral agency as well. I think it's very rich and there's a lot to there's a lot to think about and a lot to keep talking about. Um, just I'll address the things that you said about my account. I found all the setup actually very helpful as well, but I'll address the things that you said about my account. So um, there's a reason why I call them collectives rather than collective agents. And that's because I want to allow that there are groups that are agents that aren't collectives. So um, it's very important that the typology that I construct in the book between collectives, coalitions and combinations is the typology that I think is important for considering the duty bearing capacities of groups. Um, and so when we're thinking about, uh, say, a group that uh, 
is entirely composed of psychopaths, like a, a group, a group that has decision making procedures that is kind of an agent in that sense, but that's made entirely of psychopaths or whose procedures um, restrict the agenda to merely descriptive propositions, say to take the kind of list and pet it style stuff. When we're considering that kind of group, for the purposes of attributing duties to that group, I think that that group should be treated as if it were a coalition or a combination, as in we shouldn't, we shouldn't attribute duties to that group, we should rather attribute coordination duties to the members of that group. Um, and we should do that precisely because that group lacks the capacity um, to, to um, on either the, Fra uh, the Frankfurt sense or the Fisher and Revisa sense, uh, lacks the, ca the capacity for moral agency. So. Um, in collective analogues of um, the unwilling addict or the person who's under the powers of a malevolent hypnotist, if we imagine that a collective could be in these situations, um, I would say that, ki that kind of um, group is um, an agent. Um, it's not a collective by my definition, because by my definition, a collective is a group whose decision-making procedures can attend to moral considerations. And we're assuming that um, these kinds of addicted or hypnotized groups um, can't attend to moral considerations. So it's not going to count as a collective on my view. It's going to be an agent, but it's going to count as a coalition or a combination, which I know sounds strange. But the reason I want to say that is because um, instead of attributing duties to that group, we should attribute coordination duties to its members. Um, and I think but it, it's a good, I think it, um, it's definitely true that the book is written as a um, all group agents are collectives, all groups that are agents are collectives, but I actually I actually don't think that's true. And in fact, it's in, if they're engaging with your work and thinking more about these issues since the, in the two years since the book was published, that I've come to lean more and more on this um, quirk of my definition of collectives and the, and the kind of resulting fact that there can be groups that are agents that are not collectives and, and come to lean more and more on the fact that, yeah, when I'm defining collectives, I'm talking about the groups that are able to be duties, the groups that are moral agents, but those aren't the only groups that are agents. And so, yeah, uh, I I'm, I'm with you. A, a, a hypnotized group or an unwilling addict group um, is maybe an agent for some purposes, but it's not an agent for the purposes of attributing duties to it. Uh, and my account agrees with that. Although I, yeah, I, I agree that it's slightly straight. Well, I mean, you didn't quite say this, but it is slightly strange to think of such groups as being mere coalitions or combinations. Uh, but that's kind of the result of the, the view. Frank, do you want to respond or? Yeah, if, if I can very briefly comment. Uh, I, actually, one of my hypotheses while preparing this talk was indeed that this was a stipulative definition. Um, and, and that's that fits with what you're saying now. And uh, yeah, I don't shy away immediately from uh, the idea that you might treat a collective agent as a coalition. Uh, I can see that that uh, might make sense under certain circumstances. Um, the remaining worry I, might, uh, I have is that if you um, handle the kind of cases that I've discussed by saying, well, these are not collective moral agents, you gloss over the dis distinction between exemptions and excuses. So uh, in some case, uh, cases, um, uh, you, uh, that's, that's the point. Uh, so you might say a psychopath is exempt because it's not a moral agent. But the examples are about uh, conditions under which a, a moral agent is um, excused due to special circumstances. Um, so it seems you still need to, uh, are, um, to complicate the account of moral agency because of them. So that's a further kind of uh, issue that I would press if, uh, yeah, if you have time. Thank you, that's helpful. And I, I haven't thought about that distinction. Um, another important thing about the book is it's only about forward looking it's only about duties it's not about backward looking attributions of responsibility and the sense of blame and so on and I actually think uh, I increasingly think that these two phenomena are very different um, so I think we can blame lots of groups that can't have duties which is 
controversial. I haven't argued for that anywhere yet, but it remains something that I think. So um, anyway, that exemptions and excuses might fall a bit more under the backward looking responsibility side of things. Um, but in so far as they are forward looking, so we want to say you have a duty, but in a kind of, um, it's a future directed, it's an obligation that you have, but we say uh, you have this duty, but you're somehow exempt because of your current capacities uh, versus being excused. Yeah, I, I haven't, got a good theory of that distinction and it might be that I um, can't capture it but I suppose the book really is concerned with um, when can we attribute a duty to this thing and I would have thought the question of whether we can attribute a duty to it gets the same answer regardless of whether it's exempt or whether it's excused like maybe maybe that's not true <laughs> but and I should I'll that can, you, you can you can have the last word go on Frank <laughs> <laughs> you're mistaken uh, <laughs> no, yeah, uh, I, these are very difficult issues, but I, I, I would think that in, um, cons that when you're excused, indeed, you won't um, have an obligation. But the further question is, does what it means to be a moral agent, does that have to accommodate certain co complexities, like having a moral point of view? in order to explain that um but it sounds like we are on our way to a very exciting uh, discussion about these things thank you wonderful our next um, critic or commentator is leonie smith from the university of cardiff leonie why don't you give you give, give us your comments thank you thank you yes yeah, so i'll share my screen now if you can all see that um, yeah so um yeah so i i i really like steph's book as well um so um i guess it would be odd if i didn't but um i find it a really helpful way to think about groups and to um make these distinctions between different types of groups and the kinds of duties that attach to them um particularly because that some of the things that i've been worried about for quite a while are about individual duties when we talk about groups and this really sort of gives you this categorization. And so um, in my comments, um, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent as usual, but um, I really wanted to focus on certain types of groups that I don't see talked about as much uh, in the literature. Well, certainly not talked about as collectives or even potential collectives anyway. Um, if we do talk about them, it tends to be thought of in a certain way. So I, I've called it Thoughts About Twitter Users, prompted by Stephanie Collins's group duties. Um, but it's, it's kind of actually thoughts about uh, users generally. So I explain that as I sort of get going. Um, so uh, to start with, I was going to explain you know, Stephanie Collins's tripartite distinction, but um, as, as always, that was made very clear in uh, the talk that we just heard um, in the first place. But just to sum it up, my understanding of it, uh, you have uh, collectives. So this is the kind of thing we think of as a, uh, a full group quite often. Um, so they have a group level decision making procedure um, and uh, that procedure has the potential to attend to moral considerations. So that's how Steph categorizes these things. Um, you've got the coalitions, um, so here, uh, each individual um, uh, has the same goal as every other individual within the coalition, at least one goal anyway, um, and the agents there are disposed to work together to achieve that goal. It might be a moral goal, it might not be a moral goal, it could be any kind of goal. Uh, and then you've got just combinations, which um, a very permissive account on, on Collins's account, uh, but any collection of agents that don't constitute a collective or a coalition. Um, so that's that's the three kind of parts that we're talking about. Um, and then when it comes to the individual member duties or the individual agential duties, I better say, um, there are distinctions between them, which again, Steph's kind of gone through in her talk. So for the collectives, if a collective has a duty to see to it the X, then each member, because they're a member, has a duty to use their role if possible and as appropriate with a view to seeing it to it the next. So this is the idea that it's not about being defining your role, but it's about using your role to try and achieve whatever the duty that the collective has, if you're a member of a collective. So that's how this falls onto the individual agents. Uh, within a coalition, it's a different situation. Um, that's, it's not the case that these duties are gonna derive down in this kind of way. Um, 
Instead, members should at least, they should at least presume that others will do what they individually can to further whatever that shared objective is that they have as a coalition. Um, and they should assume that individuals will be doing that. And then they should perform coordination duties accordingly in the two ways that Steph mentioned earlier. So by acting responsibly to the members uh, with a view to remedying the situation or something, uh, or by taking individual responsive steps to uh, try and create a collective that could bear and perform the duty to do something about the situation. And then finally in the combinations, um, they've got the same coordination duties, but they don't have the, the right to presume that uh, others will do what they individually can to further the same objectives as them. So these duties are going to be limited necessarily by what each individual believes about the other's likely actions. So that's my uh, re re <laughs> repeating of, of what Stephanie Cohen said, but it's kind of important to, to where I'm going with it. Um, that there are these really important differences uh, in the level of duties that individuals might have and where they come from, depending on what kind of group you've got there. Um, and so, um, as I sort of said at the beginning, my, my interest is in a particular kind of group, um, because the literature on individual duties uh, does cover a, a huge range, actually, of known collectives. So we talk about voluntary groups, uh, book reading groups, clubs, uh, groups in organisations, like the, the Committee to Do X, corporations themselves, states, and so on. Um, but what I don't tend to see happening, or and, and I think it's because the number of assumptions are being pre-made actually about um, this kind of group, um, uh, discussions about whether or not uh, service users uh, as groups uh, are always just combinations. Um, so whether or not users of services could be something more. So my key question is effectively, um, are groups of users of services always only combinations? So I'm, I'm really keen to hear what Steph has to say about this, um, uh, with potential just eye reasoning coordination duties and so on. Or are some groups of users actually coalitions? Um, or even whether we think it's proto or not collectives, um, and I'll say more about that in a minute, uh, with already existing coalition reasoning coordination duties, or even stronger membership duties deriving from being part of an actual collective. Um, uh, and I've put in brackets and rights, I'm not going to talk about rights today, but that's because we're talking about duties, but um, that's something that um, I'm, I'm pretty concerned with when it comes to talking about duties. Um, and so the case I'm going to look at um, from the headlines, this isn't a surprise, uh, is Twitter and, and really any other similar social media um, collective. Twitter is probably the easiest to, to think about, but um, we might also think about yeah, Facebook, but also TikTok and potentially certain others as well. Um, so why am I asking about Twitter? Well, uh, apart from the fact that I'm at the moment quite interested in media and social media and things like that, um, really it's it's kind of a, a new source of these kind of global collective harms that could be happening. So pre-social media, only powerful individuals could really cause real harm while exercising their epistemic freedom. Now, not, not on a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, but in terms of like affecting a huge population in some way, um, you could only do that if you had a platform. Um, so I don't think that's too controversial to say that you need a platform in order to do this. Um, and it was done in a kind of, um, individualistic way so it's based on your platform and what you're saying it doesn't necessarily need to interact with uh, what other people are doing uh, but in the era of social media of course individual acts so um, things like on twitter tweeting sharing liking can themselves come come together to cause real harm so suddenly you've got this huge population uh, across the world of people who uh, previously couldn't have collectively caused a massive uh, epistemic harm for example but now can um, and so it's creating a new kind of global collective harm, I think. Um, and that makes it just genuinely very interesting uh, as a case to think about. Um, so that's that's why I'm thinking about Twitter in particular. Um, and my questions are, do users have coalition reason duties to potentially influence Twitter and influence uh, whether these harms can be caused or prevented and so on? Um, or do they have potentially even stronger membership in the Colin sense, not the user agreement membership uh, alone type sense duties to address these harms, um, duties that are not limited, so ignore the very phrase in there, not limited to just I reason type duties. Um, and so um, thinking about this more specifically, what it might mean is some of the implications are that um, there could be potentially, if we think that there could be uh, a coalition here, that could lead to duties to reason together to try and change Twitter. 
Um, so I'll talk about what the shared epistemic goal might be in a, in a minute. Um, and as a global group, that could be more powerful and that could actually lead to something very different in terms of the duties that they uh, are required to perform than if they're simply a combination of users who are guessing at what everybody else wants uh, from this thing. Uh, so on the, on the further extreme, uh, there could be duties, just duties relating to these harms. The duties relating to ethical as well as epistemic harms caused by the service. Um, if the group can bear moral duties, these could drive down to the individuals. Um, and then the bit I'm not really going to talk about, just are there any derived rights that would fall from any of this? So that's, that's why I'm thinking about Twitter in these kinds of ways. Um, so the question then is obviously, for me, who is or are Twitter in a sense? Um, so we talk about Twitter, we tend to mean the corporation, but of course Twitter is not just a corporation. Um, it's actually the use of a whole bunch of things. Um, so uh, one answer you might have to who is Twitter might be something like, uh, it's the service. So you've got like, well, I've put at the bottom there is Twitter Corp, uh, something like that. It's the service. These are horrible names. I'm not attached to them, but you know, just try and create this distinction. You've got a service plus separate service users. So you've just got the service, you've got service users. And the users are just a combination of individuals who are using it. So you've got Twitter Corp plus n number of users just out there as agents. Um, or you might think it's something stronger than that. You might think that it's the service uh, plus something stronger, something more like participants aligned to a goal, um, in which case we, the user would be a coalition. And we have something more like Twitter Corp plus, and I've used these little squiggly lines, Twitter participants to try and indicate that's not a, a collective, that's a, a coalition. Uh, or Maybe we'd see something even stronger than that, um, where the agents, and this is this is how I've put the gloss on it anyway, and there could be there could be, I'm sure there are alternatives to this, but agents who are together comprising some kind of public sphere, that's how I'm glossing it out in another work, together. Uh, so the users are actually a collective of some kind. And there, what you might have, well, you still have Twitter Corp, because there's still be this institution, this corporation that does whatever it does. Um, but you might also have T-Sphere, Twitter Sphere um, over here as well. As another kind of collective. Um, and actually, in this category, I'm leaving it open as to whether Twitter Sphere includes Twitter Call or whether it's just the individuals. And that I haven't got too far in thinking about. So I'm interested to hear um, what, what Stephanie thinks about that. Um, I, I don't know if she's even going to get on board with some of the things I'm saying anyway. So we'll see if it gets that far. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of groups that you might have. And clearly, you can see we're talking about very different types of groups there. Um, and so when you're thinking about this, well, the first intuitive thought, I, I think if, I don't think people are tending to think about this too much, but the first intuitive thought might be, well, yeah, Twitter users are a combination of service users. So it's Twitter Corp plus users. Um, but um, obviously I want to suggest that maybe there's something else going on. Um, and what I want to say is that social media corporations, as I've indicated earlier, create these unusual conditions for service users. Um, so because, a social, a social media situation, so Twitter, uh, it's not about, um, so I might be a user of, um, you know, some kind of uh, antivirus software or um, a service user of various things. I'm doing that on my own. It's not about communication. The whole point of Twitter is that it's a platform for communication. Um, and so what this means um, is that there's a shared interest, I think, in the epistemic hygiene of that environment. Uh, it literally just becomes unusable if it's utterly polluted uh, by some of the epistemic harms at the very least. Uh, and so we might think this at the very least means that the, these users have a goal in common. Um, and, I, and I believe that is the case, that there's a goal that everybody has individually, which they reasonably expect other, other people to have, which would indicate they, they could well be a coalition. Um, and secondly, um, by virtue of what it is, you have this ability to communicate and coordinate very easily. Um, it's, it's literally a platform for communicating. So um, social media, as I say, it's literally a communication platform. There's no reason that service users can't easily communicate intentions, deliberate and form plans. There's, there's just no reason. And in fact, we, we see this all the time. So people have already used these large social media corporations, including Twitter, for real world activism. Um, so uh, to coordinate action in the case of um, protests you know, in, in Syria and various other places. So uh, they've demonstrated precisely this ability. Um, so uh, that just seems very clear to me that this is, they're creating these kind of unusual conditions uh, as a, for the service users. Um, so perhaps I think Twitter users might be better described as a coalition of users of Twitter participants in this way. Um, but then the bigger question, the one that I think will be more contentious is, could there be anything more to it than even that? Um, so this is a bit where people will 
I think, tend to disagree more with this. And I'm, I'm not actually hugely attached to these views yet. I've, I'm really just trying to work it through. So I'm hoping that um, Stephen Collins is gonna help me work that through as well, and Frank as well. So Twitter is more than a service. Um, that's the thing I want to say here. So we talk about services and we talk about platforms, but it isn't just that, it is a public sphere. Um, and so this is something I think that users recognize when they're using Twitter, they go on there to be part of a discourse of some kind, that's that's what they're doing. Um, they're not, hopefully not everybody's just shouting into the void. Um, but this is also recognized by the CEO of Twitter. This is how he thinks of Twitter now. And it's not how he thought of it at the start. He's very clear on that. Um, he says people see Twitter as a public sphere, a public square, and therefore they have expectations they would have of a public square. So this idea that it's more than just a service, it's actually a facilitation of something. And so um, Fane Eichel and I talk about this um, somewhere else. Uh, so it's more than so, it's a public sphere, and the public sphere is made up of the people who comprise it. It's not just the infrastructure that holds it up. Uh, it's not just the park and the tunnel system, it is the actual participants themselves. You wouldn't have the sphere without them. Um, so as a public sphere, I think that Twitter users are more like a social group, like a reading group or something, uh, than they are like, for example, just this idea of a global humanity or, or something like that. Um, and my reason for thinking this is because you've got the bit where, yes, the participants uh, in the group, the public sphere wouldn't exist without them, it'd just be a platform. Uh, but also they do share this goal, they're a suggestive one, and they do seek to influence one another. Um, and so there's, there's the potential with all of this going on that there, there may well be a collective here. That's, that's my thoughts, just on my reading of, of how we're defining those things. Um, now there's gonna be questions, I know there are gonna be questions when, I'll leave that about um, decision-making processes and how that actually comes about. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that, but I think that there might be some, at least some case for there being some kind of proto group here. Uh, so you've got these kind of four criteria, I think that social media corporations, particularly Twitter exhibit um, and that make them quite distinct. Uh, the shared goal that they've got in the epistemic hygiene of the community, this ability to just communicate and coordinate easily, the fact that Twitter is more than a service, I think it's a public sphere, um, and the fact that as a public sphere, uh, I, the, the way that they interact uh, means that they're not like some coll random collection of people. Um, they are more like a group actually uh, who can work together and potentially be fit to, to, to discuss and actually deliberate on moral uh, duties. Um, so it might be an argument for the existence of Twitter sphere. That's all I'm going to say. So <laughs> that's that's basically the uh, the three groups. So if you remember, these were the uh, the membership duties or the non-membership duties that you might have um, initially, depending on where you come from. Um, I think that potentially they might have these kind of regulation duties I talked about, and these might be much more effective if they are a, co a collective, uh, uh, a combination at least. Um, so as a minimum, they've got an epistemic hygiene goal that I think that they can expect everybody else to share. And that should indicate, if we're talking about high-low games, uh, that they should be pursuing these optimal strategies. Um, uh, uh, and then on the other side of things, I think that there could be further duties, um, more moral duties, stronger ethical duties about who are we giving the voices to, how are we actually organising the space if Twitter sphere is causing the harm itself. Um, and effectively, whether they have rights is going to depend on a whole bunch of things, but at least their duties, and at least whether Twitter Core is actually a member here, um, or if there's something distinct. Uh, so yeah, so I'm just going to leave a bunch of my questions up on screen that Steph may or may not wish to answer. Uh, but service users as groups, have you thought about this? Uh, what conditions would actually make them a coalition or a combination, so uh, 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 a collective? Um, and there's a bunch of thoughts I have there about different types of service user groups that we might think about with a spelling mistake, massive, not massive. Uh, the relevance actually of doing any of this, uh, so it might be that some people think that's not gonna make a difference to the duties actually. Um, I think it does for various reasons. And just the risks of identifying this kind of group. Um, if, it, if, if they do come with rights, where does it lead? But, but also is it too permissive about moral agency and what, what on earth's going on here? Um, and so maybe, maybe Frank would have some thoughts on that as well. Uh, so that's it. So that's my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Leonie. Um, yeah, Stephanie, do you want to respond? Yeah, I would I would love to, although I'm going to try and keep it short because I would also love to hear what Frank thinks, because Frank accused me of being too permissive about moral agency and now Leonie's taking us uh, several steps further. So I'm keen to hear Frank's, Frank's thoughts on this proposal. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. And like, no, I have not thought about users of social media as falling under any of my categories really and I definitely would have 
my knee jerk reaction would have been to fall into this like standard view that you described of thinking that um, users of social media are mere combinations. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, what you've said just now, I, I do find somewhat convincing. So um, one thing to note, um, something I just, just searched the book to check that where I say it's on page 19 in the book. I note that um, sometimes the goals that are shared uh, by the members of a coalition of a coalition can be shared kind of implicitly or unconsciously or tacitly so i give the example of like everyone in the cafe shares the goal of a bomb not going off in the cafe right now none of us are thinking about that but if we suddenly became aware of the bomb we'd be able to coalition reason about um trying to just dis, you know dis disarm the bomb or whatever um and yeah and so in that sense we're a coalition with that goal um, so I, so I, I, I do, I am actually fairly permissive about um, which kinds of groups can be coalitions. Twitter users, though, I think I would want to say they maybe have the shared goal of like Twitter continuing to exist, or that might be. Or, it's hard. I mean, each individual has the goal of that individual being able to keep using Twitter, but that's not the same goal, right? If I have the goal of Steph being able to use Twitter and Frank has the goal of Frank being able to use Twitter, we don't share a goal. That's not a goal that we have in common. So the goal has to be agent neutral. It has to be um, uh, the same goal for each of us, not, not that each of us has that goal only about ourselves, if that makes sense. Um, so it, it would have to be a goal like Twitter continuing to exist, maybe they all have that goal and then they're a coalition around that goal. I'm less sure that they are a coalition um, with the goal of uh, epistemic hygiene. I think just because I distinguish interests from goals. Um, and the reason for that is um, when we're thinking about uh, what we're going to assume other people do, other people don't always act on their interests. Right? I mean, Twitter users are a prime example. If they have an interest in epistemic hygiene, most of them are not pursuing that interest. Well, not pursuing it very effectively, right? So if I'm gonna make assumptions about what Twitter, I'm, by the way, I'm not on Twitter, so I don't really know how it works, but I suppose I was. If I'm gonna make assumptions about how other Twitter users are gonna act um, in the service of some goal, um, some morally important outcome like Twitter being epistemically hygienic, then I shouldn't assume that other Twitter users are going to act with the goal of Twitter being epistemically hygienic, right? I should assume that other Twitter users are going to be a bit rubbish as Twitter users are with epistemic hygiene. Uh, so, so that's why I would I want to distinguish goals from interests because I want to say if you share a goal with someone, you can assume that they're going to pursue that goal in your actions. You can't assume other people are going to pursue their own interests because people don't always pursue their interests. So. I agree Twitter users might be a coalition. I'm less convinced that they're a coalition with the goal of epistemic hygiene. Um, and uh, I wanted to say something else about your comments as well. Oh yeah, so on um, whether Twitter users could be a collective or at least a proto collective um, because it's kind of a public sphere. I think that's really interesting. And a lot of people think that I'm too permissive about who gets included in states and corporations. So like, for example, I think shareholders are members of corporations. Many people think that's just wild. Um, I think ordinary voters, <laughs> Frank doesn't, but people do. I um, uh, think that um, ordinary voters are members of um, democracy. Some people think that's wild. So um, in general, my disposition is to be kind of, yeah, to kind of be on board with this possibility that users could be members of the collective that they use. Um, my, my worry with Twitter is whether there is in fact an existing decision making procedure. I agree there's the, there's the possibility of a decision making procedure coming about, but I mean, there's, there are millions of Twitter users, right? It's not like they use majority rule or deliberation, like, you know, com, like um, giving and receiving reasons for one another to make decisions or you know, there's no, if there's no existing procedure. If we put two Twitter users some proposition P, they would have, I don't think they have a procedure for coming to a group attitude towards P. So I agree that it's possible, but I, I'm skeptical that it's there yet, collective agent, um, collectiveness for Twitter users. Yeah.
that's my that's my hot take but i'm I, yeah, yeah. I, I want to hear from you but i would also love to hear from frank <laughs> yeah yeah no i sort of realized if you drew a line here there's like you know there's frank and there's steph and there's me going what about this uh, over here on the permissible scale maybe but but i i i think that's it and, and actually what i do want to stress is that i'm not actually hugely attached right now saying they are um collectives um for example it's more i'm just trying to explore this and see if if it is, because I'm interested in duties and I'm interested in what that's, that's going to lead to um, in terms of rights. But um, just so on, on the last bit first, just on the collective side of things, um, I think that's true that there isn't an existing decision making procedure there um, in, in the Twitter sphere um, across the entire thing. So it's not like everybody says, now we put our votes and stuff like that. Um, what I think I'm thinking instead is more that what you do have though is like if you think about a deliberative democracy, you've got the deliberative bit kind of there um, and see so this is the proto bit and maybe there's, there's something that could come from this um, and so there's the deliberation there's the you know the, the language cues there's all this stuff going on um, and we're coming to you know hotly contesting quite often like what should happen on Twitter happens on Twitter it's discussed on Twitter so should um, uh, Twitter be fact checking people uh, like Donald Trump and stuff like that. That's a huge debate on Twitter, um, and then people were doing that. So the deliberation happens, but also lots of other things as well. So, so yeah, I do think that's fair. Um, but I wonder if there's there's something, um, and if there was some kind of like this is they're almost this is hard. It's hard for me to decide because really, what should happen is the group comes first, then come the duties. But, but I'm starting to think is could the co could the coalition duties start to lead to through their work to uh, pursue the best uh, course of action uh, with Twitter Corp, uh, lead to things like the creation of some kind of forum group or something else. And then suddenly they've created the, the collective. So I suppose that's what I'm thinking on that side of it. Um, and then on, so on the other stuff as well. Um, so yeah, on the, um, the coalition, I, I think, again, I think that's very fair as well. I think, yeah. Um, you're right, you do distinguish between the interests and goals and quite right as well, because um, not many of us always act in their own best interest. Um, so the, the goals thing, I think what I would phrase it as is not just that I want to be able to use, it, there's almost, the, there's, there is the, the goal that I want to be able to use Twitter uh, for the service user. I think that comes with some implicit uh, goals that, so if I want to be able to use Twitter, it's got to at least not be entirely just completely full of conspiracy theories and stuff like that or it's got to be not a complete disaster zone where I can't trust anybody on here uh, in any way shape or form um, but does that go as far as saying we've got a goal of a uh, healthy epistemic environment maybe not yeah maybe not so maybe it's going to be a bit weaker than that but if we've got this shared goal at least of Oh, we've all got the goal, sorry, individually, which we have of um, being able to use Twitter. And we can all expect that everybody else on here wants to use Twitter, with the exception of potentially trolls and various little psychopaths and things like that. Um, then that in itself could say, well, what do I need to do that I can assume that everybody else is going to also play their part in trying to make that happen? And that, again, could lead to this kind of pressure on regulation and and stuff like that, I think, with Twitter port. So maybe that's what I think there. But I'll stop now. Thank you. That was that was great. Thanks so much for thinking about it. Just off the cuff like that as well. Terrific. Uh, Frank, do you want to? Yeah, let me uh, make a couple of remarks. I, I, I think this is uh, absolutely fascinating. Cases like this uh, really uh, press us uh, to to develop uh, the ideas further and um, and apply them. And platform platforms are a fascinating case. And I think it's important to consider different platforms. So Twitter is a, a, a very relevant uh, and rich case, but indeed, I don't think it will um, amount to a, a, a collective uh, that includes Twitter users. Uh, coalition maybe, and maybe they, they, they will have uh, certain duties because of that. I can see how that uh, might work. Um, but consider, for instance, Uber. Uh, also a platform, and what you've seen there is um, legal challenges to the to, to the challenge, uh, status of uh, uh, drivers. So the very idea of a platform is that the users are not um, members in the sense of uh, legal members of an organization. 
Um, but that has been challenged by uh, court rulings in, in the UK and, uh, and elsewhere. So basically, uh, the laws are, uh, seem to be saying they should form um, a legal entity. And that raises the question whether, from a philosophical point of view, they were already a, a collective prior to, the, to um, we were making them legal employees, for instance. Um, I, I should add that um, uh, a PhD student I'm supervising, Francisca Walls, is thinking about these matters, and I'm basically uh, using her ideas now in, uh, in explaining these points. So I, uh, I uh, would like to, uh, to mention that. But yeah, so more generally, the relation between platforms and users uh, needs more philosophical attention, and I, I think you did a wonderful uh, uh, first step. Thank you. So, and, and, and also to the students. Now, if you say Francisca, your, your PhD student friend, uh, yeah, is it Francisca? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting example. Yeah, which, is that, which does that mean that they actually were this or weren't this? And that was the kind of group I hadn't thought of, um, to be honest. Um, so I was sort of thinking about online gaming as well, particularly the role playing aspect of whether it feels like you are building a community, things like that. Um, and again, I should stress like, I'm not on Twitter and I also not an online game, so I'm being careful with how far I go with my clients. Here. But um, yeah, that's a really good example to think about. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, there would be so much more to say about uh, Stephanie Collins' book, um, Group Duties, Their Existence and Their Implications for Individuals. but we should wrap it up. I want to thank everyone, of course, first and foremost, the author, Stephanie Collins, but our critics, Frank Hendricks and Leonie Smith. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. And please stay tuned for the next videos. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>